Exposition by Charles Hedden Spurgeon Matthew 26, 17-30, 1 Corinthians 11, 20-34 Matthew 26, 17-19 Now the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where will you that we prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he said, Go into the city to such a man, and say unto him, The master says, My time is at hand, I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready the Passover note their prompt obedience, the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them. In this respect, they set an example we shall do well to follow. 20. Now when the even was come, he sat down with the twelve. This was the memorable night when the Jewish Passover was to melt into the Lord's Supper, just as the stars of the morning dissolve into the daylight. 21. And as they did eat, he said, Verily I say unto you, that one of you shall betray me. This saying of our Lord must have startled his disciples. They had all made great professions of affection for him and, for the most part, those professions were true. But this sentence must have fallen like a bombshell among them. One of you shall betray me. 22. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, and began, every one of them, to say unto him, Lord, is it? They did not doubt their Lord's declaration. They knew it must be true, and it produced in them deep emotion, they were exceedingly sorrowful. It also worked in them earnest self-examination. They did not, any one of them, say, Lord, is it Judas? Perhaps there was not one of them who could have thought so badly of Judas as to suppose that he would betray his Lord. They had such esteem for him that they had made him their treasurer. It is always wise for us to turn the glass of critical examination upon ourselves, we cannot do any good by suspecting our brethren. Suspicion stings like an adder but we may do ourselves great service by suspecting and examining ourselves. Self-suspicion is near akin to humility and truthfulness, it was so with all but one of these disciples who began to say to Christ, Lord, is it I? 23, 24. And he answered and said, He that dips his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. So, you see, dear friends, that a man may get very near to Christ, yes, he may even dip his morsel in the same dish with his Lord, and yet he may betray him, even as Judas did. We may be very high in office. We may apparently be very useful, I have no doubt that Judas was exceedingly useful to the twelve and to the master, and yet, for all that, we may betray him. God grant that we never may. Far better that we perished at our birth than that we should live to be traitors to our Lord. 25. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? He said unto him, You have said. And if he had not been a hopeless reprobate, this unmasking of Judas ought to have driven him to repentance. A man may secretly indulge in his heart a wretched design and, when discovered, he may loathe it. But, alas! There was nothing in Judas which could respond to the grace of God. 26-28 And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, 
This is my body. And he took the cup, and gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink you all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Go into any Romish church and watch the priest's performance at the altar, and see whether there is the least likeness between that mummery and this divinely appointed ordinance. I can hardly imagine two things which are so widely apart. How did the Lord's Supper ever grow into the Mass? It must have taken long years of moss and ivy and lichen and all kinds of clinging things to overgrow the original, natural column which the Saviour set up and to turn it into that mingled mangle of which the Romanists and ritualists think so much. The only safe rule is to keep close to scripture in everything, for, if you add a little, somebody will add more, and if you alter one thing, the next person will alter another and, by and by, you will not know what the original was. I have seen a peasant, in Italy, wearing a coat of which I believe neither man nor angel could tell which was the material of which it was originally made for it had been patched so often. And, in like manner, if we did not know what was the original of the mass, it would be impossible for us, now, to tell, for it has been so patched and mended that it is not at all like the original. Let us, beloved, keep strictly to the letter of God's word and also to the spirit of it, lest we err from the truth of God as so many others have done. 29, 30. But I say unto you, one will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine, until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Was it not brave of our dear Lord to join in singing a hymn at such a time as that and under such circumstances? He knew that he was very soon to die, he was going out to his last dread conflict, yet he went to it singing a psalm. It was to his passion that he was going, to Gethsemane's agony and bloody sweat. Yet he led the way there with a sacred song upon his lips. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out into the Mount of Olives. Now let us turn to Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians, at the eleventh chapter. We shall see how this supper of the Lord had been changed, even in the few years since the death of the Master. 1 Corinthians 11, 20, 21 When you come together therefore into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's supper for in eating. Everyone takes before others his own supper, and one is hungry, and another is drunk. They seem to have brought their own provisions to the assembly and to have made a feast, thereof, and they even thought that was an observance of the Lord's Supper. They differed in social position and, consequently, one had little and another much, and some even went to excess so that they were actually drunk. Paul might well rebuke such unseemly conduct. 22. What? Have you not houses to eat and to drink in? Or despise you the church of God? Do you think that, as a nominally Christian assembly, you are constituted merely that you may eat and drink? What? Have you not houses to eat and to drink in? or despise you the church of God? 22. And shame them that have not? Apostrophe making the poor who come to the gathering feel their poverty by observing the superiority of your provisions to their own. 22, 23. What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. And therefore you ought not to have gone astray. I told you how to observe this ordinance, so you have willfully erred. 
this is what I delivered unto you. 23 to 27. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this do you, as oft as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread, and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore whoever shall eat this bread, and drink this cup of the Lord, unworthily, that is, from wrong motives, without sincere faith and devotion to God. 27-29. Shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread, and drink of that cup. For he that eats and drinks unworthily, eats and drinks condemnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. You notice that I introduced the word, condemnation, instead of, damnation. That word does not correctly give the meaning of the original, it is not damnation, but condemnation, or judgment, as is clear from that which follows. 30. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. There is no doubt that God visited upon the Corinthians, in the way of chastisement, their lack of reverence at his table. Many were weak and sickly among them, and many died. They were not lost if they were believers in Christ, but the church at Corinth sustained a great loss through their departure, and I have no doubt that God still exercises a singular discipline over his own people. They that are outside are, to a large extent, left to sin as they please. Their punishment will fall upon them hereafter, but the child of God cannot be allowed to do so and he shall be chastened for his sin. The Lord still says to his spiritual Israel, You only have I known of all the families of the earth, therefore I will punish you for all your iniquities. A father may let another man's child alone, but his own boy shall not transgress without smarting for it. Such conduct as is here described does not bring damnation, for there is no damnation to them that are in Christ Jesus, but it does bring the chastening with which God visits his children when they walk contrary to him. 31. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when a church has lost its conscience and gets into such a state as this Corinthian church fell into, then, as it does not judge itself, God judges it and chastens it severely. 32. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Perhaps somebody thought, just now, I do not want to be in the church of Christ if it gets special chastening. That is one among many reasons why I do want to be in the church of Christ, for, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. 33. 34. Therefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for another. And if any man hungers, let him eat at home, that you come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will one set in order when I come.